Now, let's start off with the first area of issue and concern for us. Among doctors who die from COVID-19, more than 90% are from BAME backgrounds. And the six-week review report from Public Health England didn't seem to address that. So as doctors, I'd like to ask you what you thought of that report. I, I, I genuinely don't know who the authors of that review uh, are. I genuinely don't know, actually. Um, uh, we've heard that, there were, that, that thousands plus stakeholders gave advice. I don't know who this, I don't even know the process by which that, that took place. Uh, from our end, because we were very worried that it was now in May and we hadn't, we hadn't been formally uh, asked for any input, we proactively then wrote, and I wrote to Kevin Fenton uh, and saying, look, we, we're the doctors, you know, we, there's a serious issue uh, in terms of over 90% of doctors who have died. We have something to say. That's why we called for the review. And then we did, uh, give some uh, very, very specific proposals. Um, but it appears that our proposals and, and that from BAPIO and other organizations did, never, did not make it in the final version. I was quite disappointed with the review because again, a lot of the things that came out of it, we already knew. So on, for such an important review, why they've just kind of flicked through death certificates and got wishy-washy data, it just doesn't make any um, sense. And you know, we've got, you know, for example, in general practice, we've got things in places, we've got risk assessments in place. Uh, for example, things like the Q-risk, which you know, determine your risk of a heart attack or stroke in 10 years. Um, and you know it's individualized so why could they not put all these factors in together and come up with a risk calculator and come up with tailored advice to an individual the truth is uh, how many pandemic we had in last decades almost five pandemic i can think of which in in which i actually witnessed whether it was uh, sars whether it was mers hiv bird flu and truth is we haven't learned much that how are we going to tackle and deal with when the future pandemic comes. I think this pandemic is mother of all the pandemics which has happened since the Spanish flu in 1918. And my view, I think I've said it quite often, this one, that in the world history, if 9-11 was uh, a chapter, this COVID is a book. And in the, this book, when the chapter about us, about UK would be written, I think the headline would be a total and utter failure of the leadership. In NHS, in health service also, there's a structural as well as systemic racism. That was the kind of thing we wanted them to explore. This was the opportunity, and I call this opportunity missed opportunity. It's not just a whitewash, it's not a damn squib. I think it's total, in my view, is a blackwash. So I don't have any hope even in the second review, which people are talking about it. As a matter of fact, the equality minister in parliament yesterday, in my view, was totally ignorant. She didn't even know how many people been infected. And when it came to, she still was emphasizing that Mr. Fenton is leading that inquiry. So what could you expect from that equality ministers uh, heading the second inquiry? Something great will come out of it. I think this is waste of time, waste of paper, waste of effort of everything. There's hardly anything that we didn't know. In fact, uh, my organization, BAPIO, carried out a survey in mid-April where we expose all these things, but most importantly, Barney, you had started with asking about doctors and there's no mention about it. What we found in our survey, we were the first one to say that ethnicity is an independent factor, apart yes. from comorbidity and whether PP is available or not and so on. Um, and what needs to be done and how risk assessment is so important. So this survey, um, I fully agree that it has been a waste of time. It has been a missed opportunity. A lot more could have been done. Most importantly, there should have been some recommendations as to what needs to be done. Dr. Chand Nagpal, yes, how so concerned I'm... are you that doctors and health workers from the BAME communities are going to die as a result of the inaction of the review and the lack of recommendations and almost kicking it into the long grass. 50% of doctors in, from our BMA surveys tell us they're not even aware they're entitled to a risk assessment. So, so to prevent any future deaths, 
any future ill health, we need to protect people, uh, and that's critical. The second is PP. At the end of the day, uh, doctors are in an environment where the virus is present, people are ill. Uh, even in the non-COVID areas, you can't be sure. So you have to make sure that people are protected with the right equipment. And that links to the structural and cultural workplace factors, which is that doctors from a BAME background, and that applies to other healthcare workers, uh, are, you know, do not feel as able to raise concerns because of those historic uh, cultural inequalities. In our BMA surveys, we've been doing tracker surveys every two weeks for the last uh, two months. And uh, what, what we've heard is that three times as many doctors from a BAME background tell us that they feel under pressure to see patients without full protection, adequate protection, compared to white respondents. So we know that that culture is still there. We need to make sure that no doctor is afraid to speak out. And from the BMA's end, we will support anyone. We have now a 24 hours a day helpline, an employment helpline uh, for people to call us. But even then, I've heard people are afraid to speak out, even with the backing of their trade union. But that needs to stop. You know, I'm going in to see a patient today who um, gets regularly visited by district nurses who themselves are at a high risk and, you know, going in with a flimsy apron and, and glove and masks. And of course, you, you fear that all the time. So it would at least be nice to be acknowledged um, that, you know, whether or not... Um, you are at risk, but and then, and I feel the real reason we're probably not all being risk assessed is because they know if they do, the majority of workforces from the BAME community and they'll essentially be left without um, quite a big um, part of the workforce if it's done properly. So I think people are just letting it kind of go over their head and just see if they can it can be ignored because I've never seen this risk assessment. I've never heard anybody um, you know go through one in my experience. No family um, members, no friends, no colleagues have had this risk assessment done so far. Dr. Kailash Chand, do you think it's a case of BAME doctors having and health workers having to choose their battles because they're already uh, under the impression that if they complain, they're going to be targeted, they're going to be told that they're too difficult to work with, so they can't raise a fuss? Yes, that is definitely the history. As, as I've been part of NHS now for 40 years, this has gone on. And this was the high time that we raise these issues and make sure that things are put in the right place. The truth is, as far as I'm concerned, let me be totally radical and be totally different from what people are. I have no hope whatsoever from the second inquiry as well. I would perhaps through the Eastern Eye, through Salish, would say it's high time we seek a independent public inquiry. Anything less than that is not going to serve any purpose. Dr. Mehta, we are now at a stage where suddenly it's no longer the Public Health England, it's no longer the Health Department, but the Equalities Department. What does that tell us about the government's thinking, in your view? I think government always tries to find a way to escape. There have been so many inquiries, and what, has anything changed? Nothing. And these poor people who are giving their lives at this COVID time, they don't get chance to talk up. So this support, although it's the equality department doing it, I would be very surprised if they do something substantial. Speaking to you know some colleagues that have worked uh, previously within hospital nurses and doctors, and they've actually said, and especially some of the nurses, that because they've not got a fixed role, uh, they've been under pressure to be um, more likely to be put on the COVID ward and work with COVID patients as opposed to um, the regular doctors, um, uh, the regular hospital, or those in a training post. And you know that's. That's worrying because that's almost like saying just because you're not in a training post, you're not British educated, um, you know, you've come from abroad, that you can be kind of almost sacrificed to go and work on the COVID uh, wards. How do we save doctors' lives? How do we save health workers' lives? How do we save community lives? What should this equalities minister be doing? I think we've got to learn some lessons, got to learn lessons where people don't think right and we've got to discard where people done wrong things. I think our biggest mistake is we haven't learned anything. WHO right on the word go said that you got to have test, test, test. You test, you isolate, and you treat. We haven't done that. Even to date, the testing policy which has come is total sham, total sham. I think we got to perhaps 
improve those things. One of the things that struck me was the fact that the B British Medical Association, the biggest doctors union, had to almost beg to be involved in this first review. So from now that you've got a second opportunity almost, what steps can you take to make sure that your voice is actually not only going to be heard, but your recommendations, your observations are actually being included in the second report? What is the BMA going to do? Well, you're absolutely right. So we, we are going to be uh, directly, of course, writing to the Equalities Minister. And we will be, uh, in fact, what we're going to do is do this in a coalition. Uh, so just before this uh, webinar, uh, w um, I hosted uh, from the BMA's end a coalition of many other BAME uh, representative organisations, including, for that matter, BAPIO. And we're going to make a coalition demand because uh, this is something that, uh, that, that should have already happened but now that it hasn't, it has to happen immediately. So we will be making that demand and we will make that, that voice known. What is that demand? The demand is that, that um, the government uh, needs to make sure that its review of the issues affecting the BAME community in terms of COVID has to involve the right stakeholders and to make the necessary changes, some of which will take time because you need to understand more, but some of which need to be uh, immediate mitigations uh, to avoid further uh, death, death and ill health. Now for us as doctors, as a doctors association, we'll be of course focusing on the issues for doctors and I've already said that um, we need to make sure that we have proper protection, we have risk assessments, we keep people who are at highest risk away from um, contagious areas and so forth. But at the same time, we need to make sure that there is proper action taken for the wider BAME community as well. I, I don't think any of us could imagine that in China, they'd be expecting people to be uh, cashiers in supermarkets with no masks, no protection, and just mixing with people at the peak of the pandemic. That is what our key workers were, 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 were forced to do. Or, uh, and and our, it's our BAME communities that have been having to travel by underground uh, because they have no, and to say that you should travel by, by, by in your own car, but of course those that don't have own transport are still forced to use public transport and they've been disadvantaged. Where has the protection been for them? Why were masks not provided you know, months ago uh, when other nations had been doing so for a while? And I could go on. Mm -hmm.